Viewers of Cinema Nippon will know that we're big fans of horror. Given that it's been almost two months since we covered a horror film, how about we rectify that and get to covering something different? Where to begin, though? How about a name that some of you will likely recognize, though in a different medium? I'm not going to treat you all like you're stupid. You, you read the title. You clicked the link. You know what we're going to discuss. Sorry to butt in, but I'm not sure there are too many people who are actually familiar with the novel. Jared? From Avalanche Reviews? What are you doing here? Well, I read the title, clicked the link, and saw I was a special guest, so I figured I should probably get involved at some point or another. Well, you really can't argue with that logic. But Jared, we're actually talking about the movie Parasite Eve. You know, cinema, Nippon? Oh, right. I gotcha. Well, this is a bit awkward. Should I go? Not at all, actually. We were going to mention the game, but since you're here and you're the video game expert, would you like to do the honors? Absolutely, I'd love to. When most people hear the title Parasite Eve, they probably think of the video game released by Squaresoft in 1998 for the PS1. It came right off the heels of Square's success with Final Fantasy VII during a boom in RPGs. It was directed by Takashi Kokita, who you might be familiar with from Chrono Trigger, and produced by the father of Final Fantasy himself, Hironobu Sakaguchi. Parasite Eve was marketed as a mature horror-based RPG, most likely to cash in on the popularity of games like Silent Hill or Resident Evil. While it wasn't as massively popular as Final Fantasy VII, it was still fairly successful, getting good reviews from critics and selling nearly 2 million copies worldwide. Luckily, it was at least successful enough to inspire a follow-up the next year, though the game we would get would be an outright Resident Evil clone, which isn't very surprising due to a lot of Biohazard staff being brought on board, including the writer Kenichi Iwao. Parasite Eve 2 wasn't nearly as successful, but was still fairly well-reviewed. However, because it canonically takes a far different route with the story, I won't be discussing much of that here. What about the third birthday? We don't talk about the third birthday. What? Why not? I said we don't talk about it. Besides, we're not here to talk about the games, right? This is Cinema Nippon. People probably just want to hear about the movie. Oh, right. Before it was a game series, Parasite Eve was a film. And before it was a film, it was a novel. The book was released in 1995, with a film following as a direct adaptation of the novel on February 1st, 1997. The games, on the other hand, serve as indirect sequels to the book and the film's storyline. The original novel was written by Dr. Hideaki Sena, a pharmacologist who worked with mitochondria when he envisioned the story. Mitochondria, as you might remember from high school science class, are part of the human cell which provides energy to the rest of the cell. The power of the cell! Parasite Eve, Sena's first of many novels, was inspired both by this job and a television documentary that suggested the basis of the film. What if our mitochondria decided to end their symbiotic relationship with humans and instead seize control of our bodies? If that concept or the film we're about to watch interests you, the novel is available in English as it was translated in 2005 by Tyran Grillo. So, with the success of the novel in Japan, a film adaptation was a no-brainer for the filmmakers. Parasite Eve the film was co-produced by Fuji TV and the film subsidiary of book publishing house Karokawa Shoten, and released by Toho. The budget of the film was estimated at 550 million yen, which at the time was about 4.5 million US dollars. Even major Japanese films usually don't have major budgets compared to their Hollywood counterparts, as the population of Japan and the world population of Japanese speakers is small relative to the population of America and English speakers the world over. But honestly, for something that costs less than 5 million dollars, it looks pretty damn good. The film's script was adapted from the novel by Ryoichi Kimizuka, who later the same year would be credited for writing all of the episodes of the hilarious TV drama Bayside Shakedown, as well as its four sequel movies later on. Those are a subject for another day, though. Mostly, Kimizuka works in television, making Parasite Eve his first theatrical film. Parasite Eve was directed by Masayuki Ochiai, born in 1958 in Tokyo. Ochiai would later go on to helm two films in the now long-running Juon franchise, though he is perhaps best known in the West for his 2008 American remake of the Thai horror film Shudder. Ochiai graduated from the Nihon University College of Art. While he had worked on several TV series and movies prior to Parasite Eve, this was also his first theatrically released project, and it was a telling choice as now Ochiai is known almost exclusively for his horror output. 
Ochiai would later collaborate with Kimizuka again on Infection, one of his other well-known horror movies. Well, with such a notable crew working together, I think we've said just about enough about the film itself. If you haven't seen it, I recommend going and finding a copy and getting spooked for yourself before coming back for the discussion portion of this video. It's available easily for English speakers inside and outside of the US on DVD. Otherwise, let's just jump right in. Our film follows the love life between Toshiaki Nagashima, a scientist working at his local university, and Kiyomi, his wife of one year. Toshiaki lectures on the importance of mitochondria while a third character, a young girl, falls in a pool and gets harassed by her doctor. Kiyomi comes to visit Toshiaki, who has been so busy talking about science that he forgot and didn't even get her anything for their anniversary. She leaves while he heads to the lab to continue his research on using mitochondria to cure cirrhosis of the liver in rats. Jeez, if this guy loves mitochondria so much, why doesn't he marry it? Well, it's not like he isn't into that kind of thing. Wait, what? Trust me, if it's anything like the game, let's just say this is gonna get a little weird. Um... Anyway, the treatment is working, which is lucky for Toshiaki. On her drive home, Kiyomi passes out and dies. Toshiaki is understandably upset when he learns that Kiyomi is effectively brain dead. After some arguments with Kiyomi's father, Toshiaki agrees to let her kidney be transplanted into the young girl from before once he strikes upon a brilliant idea. And by brilliant idea, I mean that he's completely snapped and he's going to clone her. This incident actually gets brought up in the game. Later in the story, you come across a Japanese scientist, Kunihiko Maida, who references this. It's one of the few crossover points where the game connects itself to the events of the movie. Jared, I know I might be getting ahead of myself here, but why is he referencing sperm? Like I said, it's gonna get a little weird. And as a side note, in the book, there's about 50 pages dedicated to the liver surgery scene. I guess they really wanted to make it faithful to the novel. Also, if you remember the game, those kidneys are fairly important as well, so hold on to that bit of information for later. Toshiaki is successful in culturing his wife's cells, and in fact produces a full clone of her. And of course, as soon as they are reunited, they proceed to, um... And there's the weirdness. Things end up even weirder when it turns out that this is not in fact Kiyomi, but Eve, a mitochondrial being who we're led to believe may have been living inside Kiyomi long before her death. Now that she has multiple breeding grounds, both in her own culture and within the young hospitalized girl, she proceeds to wreck everything, using her superpowers of science only for Toshiaki to plead with her and for both of them to go up in flames. You could say things got a little hot between them. You see what I did there? Uh. The film ends with Toshiaki lighting the candle on his and Kiyomi's anniversary cake that she had at home earlier, followed by a sequence of their first encounters. We see all of it from Toshiaki's perspective, but there are little hints that Eve's assertions about controlling Kiyomi were false. We can't be sure, but one has to wonder. It's interesting because in the movie we have a direct connection between our protagonist and Eve, in regards to how this all ties in with the game, the young girl Mariko years later moves to America, changes her last name to Brea, and has two children, Aya and Maya. Following a similar series of incidents, Mariko ends up in a car accident with her children not too long after signing up herself and her daughters to be organ donors, just like Kiyomi. Huh, history really does seem to repeat itself. Aya ends up surviving, but Mariko and Maya don't make it, and due to a birth defect in her right eye, she ends up getting Maya's eye. Meanwhile, Maya's kidney is transplanted into another character, Melissa Pierce, who later evolves into Eve. History really does seem to repeat itself. Again, it's like poetry, so that they rhyme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. In the movie, we have a direct connection between our protagonist and Eve, while in the game, there is a lesser but just as important connection. In the game, the mitochondria comes from the same origin, Mariko and her daughter attempting to recreate the incident from the film. However, it's the same mitochondria that ultimately ends up fighting itself, but we'll get into that a bit more later. Parasite Eve presents several important philosophical questions, while not deciding to beat the viewer over the head with what the filmmakers perceive to be the correct answers to any of them. 
These questions tie directly into the film's themes of identity, destiny versus free will, and the role of human emotion when considered in an evolutionary context. First, the movie asks us to question who, or maybe more specifically, what, we are as humans. It asks us to consider the question from a scientific perspective. We are humans with unique personalities, yes, but what composes us other than a physical system of organs and symbiotic microorganisms that keep us alive? Just as the mitochondria being absorbed into our cells allowed us to evolve in the way that we did in terms of power generation and usage, the bacteria in our gut allowed us to develop the diets and immunities that we sustain, thus keeping us alive in the many diverse environments where humans live. So, the film seems to question, what are we but a complex system of discrete parts functioning together to create a whole? The game elaborates on this by showing us a post-mitochondria world and how it might function if that symbolic relationship didn't exist. The game is full of pretty disturbing imagery of horrifically mutated animals and a completely abandoned Manhattan. In context, these familiar creatures and settings are effective in how disturbing they become. Everything is aggressive with even normally passive animals assuming the roles of predators. Rats who would normally coexist with humanity attack us, not for survival, but out of aggression. Now it's hard to say if the game was trying to make a statement, or if they just needed interesting enemies to fight, but the context of the game with the knowledge of the film paints a pretty bleak picture. The film continues as we see Toshiaki's revelations concerning Kiyomi to ask what happens when our consciousness dies, or when parts of the system are removed or replaced. Kiyomi becomes brain dead, meaning she has no conscious control over her body. Even some unconscious processes, like breathing, cease, and Kiyomi needs the power of science to keep her alive. So, the film asks, are we truly alive once the mind has all but vanished thanks to brain death? Though her brain has stopped, her other organs continue to live, not just in herself, but also inside Mariko's new kidney. Toshiaki claims that through this transplant, just as through his cloning of Kiyomi using her liver tissue, Mariko and Toshiaki are both keeping her alive in different ways. Parasite Eve reminds us that, though our bodies have the capability to assimilate foreign organs and blood into our bodies, these materials had to come from another human. The film questions then, where do we draw the line between ourselves and others? It's like rebuilding the engine of a car and wondering, is this the same car if the internal parts have changed? At what point does the foreign material stop being part of the donor, and when does it become part of the person receiving the transplant? In Mariko's case, Kiyomi's tissue begins to infect her body as a parasite, effectively meaning that the donated kidney can never truly be Mariko's, rather that Mariko's entire body will eventually be Eve's. In Toshiaki's case, his first successful clone of Kiyomi is identical to Eve, the mitochondrial being who had been controlling her actions. Toshiaki's decision to die for her at the end, despite not being Kiyomi per se, leaves it ambiguous as to who exactly he was in love with. Did he love Kiyomi, who he thought she was, or did he love Eve, who she has revealed herself to be? Discussing Eve leads to the second important question of Parasite Eve. Do we possess free will, or is there in actuality a force driving us, like fate or destiny? The film seems to be pointing in both directions at different times. In terms of destiny, it could be argued that it was Toshiaki's preordained path to become a scientist working with mitochondrial tissue cultures, and to help birth the next evolutionary predator with Eve. But when you look a bit beyond the idea of a human's path being controlled in this context, you realize that it is not being controlled by a god or an omniscient purpose, to which destiny and fate are commonly attributed. No, Toshiaki's destiny is repeatedly talked about by Eve herself, another living being, who actively controls Kiyomi and later Mariko in order to reproduce effectively. The film asks us to consider the implications of this perhaps in two different ways. The first being that we as humans could very likely be overcome evolutionarily by something as seemingly insignificant to such highly intelligent creatures as us. Something like our own mitochondria, or our own need to reproduce. Is love nothing more than a chemical reaction, if you take the film in a cynical context? You could argue that the game continues on with this theme. The same events happen down to the car crash, making withdrawal from a sperm bank, to an attempt at giving birth to the ultimate being. It seems like these events might continue to cycle over and over again as if it's some sort of destiny. 
Aya herself is brought to an opera on a whim when in fact she might have been controlled by her own mitochondria. It's even more overt if you think about the medium. As a game with a linear story, the events are always going to happen the same way. Parasite Eve was produced in a time when the majority of games didn't have alternate endings, but that's not to say that the Destiny idea couldn't have been intentionally invoked by the creators either. The precious systems of our bodies that we seek to maintain, whether with mitochondria providing ourselves the energy to survive, or on a higher level with Madiko needing a functioning kidney to cure her chronic renal failure, could at any time be compromised by a blow to the foundation of these systems. Like our mitochondria being used against us as a weapon, like with the people set on fire throughout the film. This is an over-exaggerated display of mitochondrial power, but it is entirely possible for our bodies to become their own worst enemies via disease, with our immune systems failing or deciding to attack themselves. Perhaps Parasite Eve is trying to tell us that the next major predator will not come from without, but from within, from the microorganisms we trust blindly to help us live, and that this change will not be fate as we understand it in a divine or predestined manner, but simply by the decision of something we have underestimated. This can be taken in a broader context as well, whether it was intended by the filmmakers or not. Mitochondria are, throughout the project, referred to as parasites and symbiotes, organisms that benefit from our existence just as we benefit from theirs. If you remove this narrative from the realm of the human body and instead view it in the context of the planet Earth, you might see that, in a metaphorical sense, the same can apply to humans on a larger scale. Perhaps Parasite Eve is trying to give us a metaphorical account of the rise of humanity, where the mitochondria are our stand-ins. We worked with the Earth until we reached a point through symbiosis where we could exploit it more than help it, and we took control of our hosts. We upset the balance that nature will assume if untainted by intelligent life. We turned the system against itself. In essence, humanity is represented by Eve, and perhaps her death at the end of the film is symbolic of our need to perish in order to restore balance to nature. This could be in keeping with what Masayuki Ochiai said regarding the supernatural in an interview. Quote, In Japan, people believe that everything, even a tiny little bug, has a spirit or a soul. We tell children, if you do something horrible to a dog, that dog will come back to haunt you. It's kind of a discipline, so the idea of spirits is used to raise children. Ghosts and spirits are embedded in Japanese culture." End quote. So it could be that the filmmakers and author are even unconsciously saying that if we are abusive of both the earth and of our bodies, then both will come back to haunt us. The game, on the other hand, lacks this subtlety. Quite literally, one of the scientists says, starting with the incident in Japan and now this, I wonder if this is a message to all mankind. If the Earth is a single human being, we humans that invade the Earth become like viruses out of control. We in essence are upsetting the natural balance of the body. This is definitely utter destruction. You see, humans, in essence, are parasites. You can say that we're parasites and the world is our host. While way more preachy than the film, it definitely suggests that when parasites don't live symbiotically with their hosts, the situation turns destructive for both parties. While we could be cynical and say that humanity is nothing but a destructive force for the planet we live on, we often see the opposite in fiction. Square literally made a game exploring the exact same theme immediately before Final Fantasy VII. Eve is a manifestation of when that parasitic host relationship is no longer symbiotic. Aya, on the other hand, represents when that relationship can remain symbiotic. Given the common origin of the cells that gave birth to Eve and which give power to Aya, the game suggests that it's the individual that makes the choice. Lastly, the film revisits emotion in the context of evolution. And I mean lastly quite literally, as it's in the final scene of the film that this is explored. Eve seems to deem herself superior to humanity, but why? Well, for one, she has her seemingly supernatural powers, but more importantly, she is an efficient organism. She is not burdened by emotion the way that humans are. Her decision-making process is centered solely around survival and dispersal of her new species. She seems to view Toshiaki and his sentimentality for his deceased wife as a burden more so than a gift, where humans will mark themselves as higher beings simply because of their capacity for emotion. Thus, the film seems to ask, what advantage does emotion provide us? Why do we as humans find it so important to establish relationships not based purely on the survival of our species, the passing of our genes? 
The only problem with this, whether the filmmakers realized this as an intentional point or not, is that Eve appears at first to be emotionless, but actually is personified in a very human way, despite being post-human and seeming to want to achieve an unemotional state. She is prideful, feeling the need to instill fear in all of humanity at the mitochondria conference, rather than simply becoming a silent killer. She, in the end, develops genuine feelings for Toshiaki, where she seemed all but past these emotions only moments before. This can be seen by how she doesn't totally set Toshiaki on fire in a friggin' instant like she does with everyone else. In this way, Eve is either an awesome subversion of the question as a whole, stating simply that any being intelligent enough to surpass us will also be burdened by emotion, or she is an unfortunate adventure into the territory of Naked femme fatale who is overcome by love and can only be satiated by a man's interest despite being a killing machine. But as far as this goes, it's up to your interpretation. How do you see Eve? What do you think the message of the film is? The game doesn't seem to have this, as it paints Eve as a monster. She seems almost obsessed with evolutionary progress and the eradication of the weaker species. Eve scores a much higher body count compared to her sister in the movie. However, this could be on account of who their respective hosts are. Aya as a character is genuinely concerned for people and wishes to do the right thing, which is what led her to be a part of the NYPD to begin with. Meanwhile, Eve, finding herself in Melissa, seeks destruction rather than salvation. Maybe the message is, despite how far we think we evolve from these things, they're still a part of us, at least on some level. Parasite Eve might not be a perfect film, just as Eve is not a perfect organism, but it is certainly a good ride that will keep you thinking long after you've finished viewing it. Everyone who works in horror as a storyteller has their own reason for their interest in the genre. Masayuki Ochiai explained in an interview with Cinema.com, quote, I love horror films, and there is a big demand for this genre, I think, because people are so stressed in their normal lives, and they can relieve this stress with another form of stress by watching these films, end quote. Parasite Eve, despite its flaws, does just this, both in an emotional and an existential manner. Check it out if you already haven't. And if you're interested in learning more about the Parasite Eve games, you can check out my channel where I have a retrospective covering the entire series. Seriously, a big thanks to Jared from Avalanche Reviews. Check out his channel if you haven't already. I would highly recommend his Resident Evil retrospective, which I may or may not have marathoned the majority of while editing this video.